Gena Kirori, NTV. Now to get us into the conversation of the day, investigators from the Directorate of the Criminal Investigations, DCRI, DCI, are pursuing numerous leads to establish the motive behind the gruesome murder of eight-year-old Chantal Nzembi. Chantal's body was discovered a few kilometers from Hakitengela Wom on Monday, just two days after her mysterious kidnapping by unidentified abductors who demanded ransom money to release her. NTV's Seth Olale revisits the last scenes where Chantal was last spotted up to the moment her body was discovered in a gunny bag by a motorcyclist. It is difficult to find the right words to describe grief. Lost in a sea of thoughts, this family is in pain, dealing with the raw emotions of losing their little angel. They turn to sing, consoling each other perhaps to numb that pain. For 37-year-old Christine Ngina, the mother of the late Chantel Nzembi, coming to terms with why anyone would take her beloved last-born daughter, whom she last saw on Saturday morning when she left for work, is so heartbreaking. Just behind Chantel's mother hangs the school uniform of the grade two pupil, of Five Hills Academy, Kitengela. The 72-hour search for Chantel began when Sharon's mother confirmed that the deceased was not in the company of her child who had gone to visit her aunt. The caller's voice was that of a woman. Chantel's mother says a few minutes later, the same caller reached out to her, this time stating that she was holding her daughter in Kiambu. On Sunday, the kidnapper kept calling, demanding the ransom money. But Chantel's mother told her she was still looking for the 300,000 shillings. The final call from the unidentified woman came in on Monday at 8.47 a.m. Two hours later, Chantel's body was discovered by a border border rider stashed in a gunny bag at Orata, barely five kilometers from her parents' home. Detectives from the Kitengela Police Directorate of Criminal Investigations, who've been tracking the anonymous caller since the incident was reported, spent the better part of Tuesday interrogating persons of interest, including neighbors, to establish the motive behind the gruesome murder of 80-year-old Chantel Nzembi. No arrest has been made so far as detectives handling the case analyze the phone call records. According to locals here, incidences of insecurity have been on the rise. Just last week alone, a 10-year-old pupil was abducted by unknown persons. She was luckily found alive in Isinia. Seth Olale, NTV, Kitengela, Kajedo County. The sad and unfortunate story of Chantal Nzembe right there. She's one of the perhaps thousands of Kenyan children who go missing every year for various reasons, perhaps uh, ranging from lack of supervision to even uh, the dangerous issue that we will be talking about in a short while of child trafficking. That's what we want to talk about this morning on your world, the burden of missing children in Kenya. And I have my guests this morning who are ready to help us dissect this conversation. Mariana Munyendo is the founder and CEO of Missing Child Kenya. Welcome to the show, Mariana. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. And joining us also in studio this morning is Vivian Mangoli. She's the principal children officer at the Department of Children's Services. Vivian, good morning and karibu. Good morning, Victor. Thank you very much. 
Asante. And also in studio with us this morning is Christine Masharia. She's a shelter manager at a, an organization called Awareness Against Human Trafficking in Kenya. Good morning, Christine. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Victor. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Mariana, let me just start with you and, 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 and perhaps get your reaction to, to the story we've just watched. It's perhaps one uh, of the stories that happen every day. Some make it to the headlines, some do not. And I'm very sad that we have actually having this conversation a day after that child who was kidnapped um, is found to have been murdered after the family, of course, could not raise the amount uh, that the abductors were demanding. Any, any family of a missing child, once a, a child is missing, every such effort is geared towards bringing the child back home because I think the, the safest place for a child is with family. And so when it happens now that we get to the tragic point that this child is no longer alive uh, and is found diseased, it, it gives now um, a projection of many other extended issues around the family. This is a sad moment. This is a, a moment of anxiety, worry, anger, a lot of emotions in the family, in the community as well, because this child is not a standalone unit. They go to school somewhere, they play with other children, they have siblings, they have relatives, they have neighbors, and so the whole community is affected by the loss of a child or any life mm -hmm. for that matter. Now, no. Obviously we don't talk about it enough, but maybe from where you sit as someone who interacts with these cases every day, just how serious uh, is this situation? Um, in terms of why we probably don't talk about it that much, it's because uh, maybe we have not um, defined to a lot of people who exactly a missing child is. Mm -hmm. So some few circumstances here and there that would qualify as a missing child, mm -hmm. the community would overlook and just say they would come back or something like that. And so they've never seen the need to highlight it so far. But with the increasing uh, participation of media in uh, matters of the community, even the online presence of being on social media, being able to use the channels available, now people are talking about it uh, more. But again, I can say there's also a difference between these cases in the urban areas and the rural areas mm -hmm. where communication networks are a little bit more sophisticated in the urban areas as compared to the rural areas. Okay. So there is underreporting and it's not because people do not care. Mm -hmm. It's just also uh, the limited awareness that there is to who exactly a missing child is. And maybe we can ask uh, Vivian to help us there. Vivian, we don't have uh, uh, some sort of a straightforward definition of who uh, a quote-unquote missing child is, really. Vivian? Yes, Victor. Yes, I'm saying we, we don't have quite um, the, the straightforward and textbook definition of who a missing child really is. Um. Uh, Yes, legally we have not gotten there defining who is a missing child and that is a gap that we are seeking to address in the Children Bill 2020. Um, currently what we render as a missing child can be just put into categories of, of children, like for example runaway children. Those are children who run away from home for one reason Mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them just are stolen from, from home by kidnappers, for example. And some of them are also stolen from the caregiver by a parent in the event of uh, parents who are not living together. Mm -hmm. Some of these children, are they get lost. You know, children get lost because, because they're children. They get lost. Maybe they didn't find their way back home. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are also found in other areas, but the parents are unaware of their whereabouts. So any child whose caregiver or parent is unaware of their whereabouts uh, is considered as a missing, mm -hmm. missing child. Okay. Yes. And definitely that's where the, the problem begins. Now, with that uh, wider sort of definition of a missing child, do we have maybe statistics uh, even in terms of uh, uh, perhaps estimation of how many children actually go missing every year in Kenya? 
Yes, we do. Um, the Department of Children's Services has what we call a Child Protection Information Management System. And through that system, we are able to capture data from our sub-county children officers where cases of missing children are reported. And again, we categorize them into different um, definitions. Like if we find a child, if a child is found, we may categorize that child as a lost and found child. So the child may be in our possession, but the parent does not know that the child is in our possession, for example. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of the category of missing children fall under. And then we also have parental abduction cases. So if we look at the statistics currently, missing children are about 1,225 uh, last year alone. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have children who were abducted by their own parents. So that is also a category that we have. Mm -hmm. We also have children on the streets because some of them who run away from home also go to the streets. And that is also another category that we have. So they may not be they may not have been clamped up together as missing children, but they are put in the different categories of what may sum up as a missing child. Okay. Yes. So 1,225, that's a huge figure. Maybe uh, we can, of course, ask uh, our viewers to be part of this conversation again. Uh, on our question of the day, we asked you um, as a parent, have you ever, of course, lost your child or, or be disconnected with your child? And how did you get them back? Be sure to engage us on social media. Um, at NTV Kenya and at VicTechyProp underscore. Make sure you can you use the hashtag new normal. You can also follow the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you want to call in, uh, our numbers will be on the bottom of your, sc your screen uh, in a short while, and you can share your experience uh, with us. But let me just go to Christine at this point. Christine, these are figures from last year, and, and, and definitely uh, the last year is that period when we had COVID-19 and, and most parents were, I mean, most children were not in school the way they used to be and, and they were forced to be home, but the parents have to be, to be at work, have to be running their normal businesses. How much of uh, a factor was, uh, of course, COVID-19 in this very same issue of uh, missing children from where you sit? Thank you so much, Victor, for the question. Um, COVID-19 highly contributed to children missing uh, for various reasons, uh, and especially trafficking, uh, for uh, domestic servitude, forced labor, mining, and also uh, for sexual exploitation. So uh, these numbers escalated even to date, and also some of them even being uh, addressed in uh, or being captured in teenage pregnancies and some of these girls uh, are ashamed of what has happened to them and are forced to run away. And just like Vivian has mentioned, some of them go to the streets. And, um, and some of them also are uh, lured by people they know, uh, like family members, uh, people in the community, and they end up being trafficked for uh, those reasons in different towns in, uh, within the country. And this has greatly uh, contributed to child trafficking. Okay, and, and maybe Christine, every time we talk about child trafficking, the loose definition that we have and the rough definition that we have is, you know, a child being trafficked uh, overseas, uh, you know, uh, as you say, for servitude and all, all those other issues. But even in, ca trafficking can happen even inside the country, isn't it? Yes, it does. Um, Trafficking happens even internally within our country and also cross-border. Like currently, uh, when we had all our borders crossed, we had a lot of inter-county uh, trafficking of uh, both children and also adults for various purposes uh, of uh, exploitation. So yes, indeed, there's internal trafficking within Kenya. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you on the issue of trafficking, but let me just come back to Marianne uh, at, at this point because P part of the bigger problem really is we don't even have a centralized system of recording, you know, how many children are missing, uh, how many of them have been found, you know, and which, which children are there. Just talk to us about uh, the gaps in, in, in this system and how it affects um, the whole issue of trying to trace children. Um, I always reiterate the point that this is not a problem unique to Kenya only. 
This is a problem that is prevalent amongst African nations and it's because of our many um, development challenges and how we are coming together to put our social systems together. I must say currently over the last uh, three years, um, the government has been very, very helpful in trying to put this issue together uh, for all the stakeholders that deal with the missing children. Uh, currently, there's a technical working group that has been uh, set up by uh, the Department of Children's Services. And in this, we are just trying to bring everyone who has any data on missing children together so that it can help us make sense. The way we have seen the description of who a missing child relates to a lot of issues surrounding missing children. It could be trafficking, child labor, FGM, any other reason. So if we bring all these stakeholders together and we start putting our data together, that is where now we are heading towards a place where we can use this data to inform policy, we can use this data to inform directives, and we can even use it to create um, a robust child protection systems as it is. Mm -hmm. And so um, now that we have a solid working place where all the data is being consolidated, then we are able now to start figuring out some things. Okay. If you do a comparative analysis of African countries, you will find that uh, there are very few other African countries that have even made the steps that Kenya has made so far in terms of trying to document who a missing child is. Mm -hmm. And so it is work in progress but I am positive that as we go by all the stakeholders who have been in different silos are bringing this data together and from this you can see we are able to now start having figures that now we can talk about uh -huh. yes and, and of course earlier on you mentioned the issue of under reporting and, and and now the issue of lack of a central database do you think this perhaps affects the issue of correct and accurate reporting maybe the figures are lower than the that, than, than we think it is a fact that the figures are lower than we think uh, because of um, the different challenges across um, the country and the different stakeholders and the different communities. I'll give an example of marginalized communities in the uh, far SL regions. And for them, they have quite a lot of challenges, not just even in child protection. Their challenges cut across many other issues that make them a little bit um, underrepresented out of lack of a better word mm -hmm. for them to be able to give accurate data for any other issue even aside of missing children. Mm -hmm. I will start with that. And uh, because of that, then we can find that now we are having increased awareness. The stakeholders like the ones that are here today, like for example, HART and the Department of Children's Services and ourselves, we are trying to really talk to the community and tell them uh, to be more vigilant to help us to report these cases because uh, a principle that we work with at Missing Child Kenya is the community are the eyes and ears. They know where to find these children. Mm -hmm. Any feedback for a missing child would come from the community. So if we involve the community, we'll be able to grow more data. And we don't need a very sophisticated out of this world systems. Mm -hmm. The Department of Children's Services has a database. It is their mandate as the government agency to hold any data that belongs to a child. And other different organizations now, if we are now starting to feed into this database and it will really help us grow a robust child protection system. Okay, and maybe maybe at that point then let's just go to, to Vivian at this point and ask uh, about uh, this very same issue now. B because the, the problem for many parents is, yes, my child has gone missing, uh, but the lack of information and awareness on what to do and the pressure, the emotions are raw, you don't know what to do. So for anyone who is watching and, uh, and for a moment you feel like the child has perhaps gone missing, where should you start? goes missing, the, the first thing is distress on, on yourself. Having experienced, they say, my, I understand. And the first place you should go, ideally, is the police station, mm -hmm. if the, there is one near you. But we also have various other government structures that you can actually report to. We advise that you can go to your nearest authorized officer, and by that I mean you can also go to your area chief. You can, you can start there. Mm -hmm. You can report directly to the children office because we have children offices all over the country in every sub-county. So you can report there. And of course, through our referral and linkages, 
you will always be linked to the police station or referred there. Okay. You can equally call the National Helpline for Children, that is the uh, 116. We have a National Helpline, depending on where you are, because time is a factor in, 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 in missing children. You can call that number and you will be assisted accordingly mm -hmm. yes and of course for anyone who is watching you know the way we normally talk about this country you would really want to be sure that every time i call that number it will will someone be at the other end to pick it yes okay yes. and maybe because we don't have a parent and i think you, you've just mentioned yourself that you in one way have been affected maybe we can just briefly um hear your story to sort of paint the picture of the agony that most parents go through uh, when their children go missing if you will permit us, of course. Yes. Um, my experience, I, I, my, my firstborn got lost that when she was two years old. And I wasn't there. I was at work, a children officer. Mm -hmm. I was at work um, on the road, actually, going to Kitengela. Then I was called by the neighbors. And by the time I was being called, uh, the child had been missing for about three, four hours and they had looked everywhere nearby, and they had not found the child. Uh, so of course, there was the issue of running back, going to where, uh, to my house, looking. The f the, there was a lot of distress around it, because the first instinct was, I need to look for mm -hmm. my child. It didn't occur to me that I can report even, because again, where do I report? I'm the children officer of the area. So. Yeah. I, the first instance was to look for my child. By the time I thought of going to, to the police station, it was about seven hours later. And surprisingly, when I went to the police station, I found my child at the police station. So we advise that you should report to the police station as quickly within the first three hours. Mm -hmm. Time is of essence. Report at the police station because anything, anything can happen. My child just walked to somebody's house who happened to be um, an administration police officer and that police officer took the child to the police station as the first instinct. And, and maybe because you're talking about time being of essence, because mm. sometimes it's, you know, wameenda kwa rafikizao, I mean, they have just gone to visit their aunt. You know, the way it's the, in the estate it can be. Uh, and you have that worry of, should I put out, you know, and notice that my child is missing and maybe... Uh, I mean, they, they're just around. How do you go about it? Do we have a timeline of, you know, maybe if it's five hours, beyond five hours, you can report your child as missing? Or do we have, or should I say, once I have looked at all the possible um, places where my child could be, um, that's immediately uh, the moment I should say my child is missing. Okay, we, we may advise you to look within the first one hour, you can look within your environment, you know, call, call. Uh, if you live in a flat, for example, check everywhere inside your house, outside your, your house, within the environment, within the first one hour. But within the first three hours, kindly report to, to, to the police station. We do not advise that you start putting posters because of the nature that criminals may take advantage of you and you might be called all the time to, to maybe people lie that we have your child and you know because of the distress that the parent has, you may do anything to get, to get the child back. Mm -hmm. So it will be important to just report and then you will be referred to organizations or the children office where your case will be handled professionally and even the nature of how we put the posters in collaboration with missing children uh, for protection of your child and also for protection of the parents as well. Okay. Yes. And, and maybe, Christine, definitely, it, I believe Kenya has been listed as uh, what you would call a source destination and, and, and destination uh, and even point of transit for, for, for child trafficking um, in Kenya and in, I mean, in East Africa and in Africa. Maybe talk to us about what that means. Do we have areas which are like hotspots for... for, for uh, child trafficking in Kenya and, 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 and what, of course, uh, can be done. It is true that Kenya is a, a, a hub of trafficking. That, is, that means it is a, a transit and also a destination point. And I would like to point out that 
mostly our border areas are very porous and uh, actually encourage trafficking of children. And this is very, uh, you can see like uh, within the Ethiopia border, Somali border, Ugandan border, and also the Tanzanian border. Um, Kenya has become a destination for children being trafficked from those uh, countries that I've mentioned. And yes, indeed, that uh, Nairobi is also a very uh, great hotspot as a place where these children are actually being brought to uh, for purposes of, uh, like we have identified uh, children from Tanzania actually being brought to Kenya for uh, forced begging. Uh, children from Uganda are being brought to Kenya for purposes of uh, domestic servitude. Uh, and also those ones from uh, Ethiopia and Somali, some of them are being used for herding, uh, cattle and sheep. Okay. Yes. And, and, and definitely then uh, that raises the point because there was this uh, documentary that was done, I think, I believe last year. And you realize that other than children actually being, uh, you know, uh, trafficked or lured, there is the issue of sale of babies, even from hospitals. And a baby could go for as low as even 40,000 shillings. Um, indeed, that is a very sad state of affair, and it is true. Uh, traffickers target most vulnerable people, and especially single mothers or people who are really affected by poverty, and especially people living in slum areas. People feel vulnerable and they are wondering, how do I take care of this child? What will I do with this child after I give birth to it? And if somebody um, gives them an offer of that low amount of 40,000, they will gladly do it. And, and they think of how much they can achieve with that kind of amount. And so this brings about illegal adoptions. And then there's also this other thing of women being actually deceived that their children have actually died. Mm -hmm. So that um, traffickers are actually working in cahoots with uh, medics and uh, these children actually end up being illegally adopted and trafficked in other to other countries or still within Kenya. Okay, maybe I can come back to you, uh, Marianne, on this because uh, clearly the, the, there is the, the gap, that, because most of the time the way we train our children really matters. And, and we, as parents, we try to do all these things. You tell your child, you know, do not say hi to someone you don't know, uh, do not go to, too close to strangers that you don't know. But research shows that sometimes when these children go missing, especially uh, in cases of trafficking, it, 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 it involves someone who actually knows them and the danger is sometimes even closer than you think. Um, I would just uh, latch on to Christine's point about um, the vulnerability and trust factor. Mm. Trust and vulnerability plays a big role in uh, incidences of child trafficking uh, because um, there's what we call grooming. A, a predator or an intended trafficker will reach out to a child, form a friendship, provide maybe what is missing uh, financially, mentally, even uh, physically by giving gifts and at, uh, I, um, articles. And from this, a trust is generated. And by the time the trafficking now happens, yeah. this child is really within a certain comfort level that the predator is able to move them away from um, their home area. And so on the flip side, Education is still very important, and that is what we really focus on on our programming at Missing Child Kenya. A child who's more informed is able to try and navigate in certain situations. We teach our children not to talk to strangers, but then if we now just change the conversation a little bit and say there are strangers who can assist you. For instance, if you're in a supermarket and you don't see your parent, mm -hmm. go to the cashier, go to the security, go somewhere where there's someone in uniform. Mm -hmm. If we now fashion these conversations into ways that don't have fear instilled in our children, yeah. our children will go grow up not fearing the world uh, to be the cruel place we have put it out to be. Okay. It's not safe, but the conversations around safety should not also instill fear in children so that it makes them more proactive. The problem is when we're having these conversations with our children, mm -hmm. we are more reactive. When an incident happens in your neighborhood, that's when you tell the children, you see what happened to so-and-so? Don't. Don't do that. 
let's start being proactive. Talk about it before it even actually happens. And before we take some feedback, I, I'm sure you saw the story of uh, the missing, I believe, four children. It must be from Kitengela who were teens. And, and it kind of uh, brings in the point of the role that social media has to play because we have teenagers who have their phones uh, and people can easily use these platforms to lure them. The, the online space has become one of the major trafficking points because our children now have access to the internet and devices as well. And so they're at risk uh, on um, in interactions with predators. Again, there is no difference between uh, online etiquette and offline etiquette. Uh, we advise parents, when, once you give a, a device to a child, also start talking about the safety around that device. Mm -hmm. The same way if a, a neighbor wants to play with you and they come and ask for permission, is the same way if your child has a device, they should be able to know that so-and-so needs permission to talk to me for one thing or the other. Uh, there's now a lot of uh, conversations around um, online safety for our children mm -hmm. within uh, the different sectors, the child protection sector, education sector. We're trying to come together and put something forward um, so that we can be able to see how best to also equip our children to be more safe online. Okay. Yes. Let's just get some of the feedback that we have, uh, you've been sending us on social media. If we can uh, quickly sample uh, some of it. We remember on our question of the day, we asked you, has your child ever gone missing as a parent? Has your child ever gone missing and how did you get them back? Let's get to see uh, how the, some of the feedback that you've been sending us. Yes, Flozi Mwangi says, she went out, for, out of my sight for an hour or so and I went through hell. I can never wish on any parent. Thank you, Flozi Mwangi. Yes, Carol Ndanu Mutua says, yes, for some hours and it was hell. Thank you, Carol. We have Zahara Omar who says it was a horrific night to, for, uh, to me on that particular day. Thank you, uh, Zahara. And we have Feruz who says my son once men went missing and it was, it was the, to the worst night uh, ever for me. Thank Allah. Um, and and a, a good Samaritan helped him uh, with the phone and he called me. Thank you, uh, Feruz. L let me just come back uh, to you, Vivian, for your reactions on that on two issues. Number one, the issue for what Feruz has raised is the issue of the fact that the child actually knew the father's uh, phone number to be able to call. Yes, it is. We, we encourage parents to actually equip their children with, with skills. And, and information, like basic things like where do you work? What is your name? What is the name of your father, your mother, your siblings? Mm -hmm. That information is very important. What is the phone number? Mm -hmm. We see uh, these days the children are very, uh, their intellectual capacity is very good because mm -hmm. a child as young as five years or three years is able to memorize the number of the parent. Mm -hmm. So but Christine, very... sometimes we find ourselves training our children that, you know, my mother is mom and my dad is daddy. Which is very wrong. Mm -hmm. I even do not encourage parents to tell children to call any other person uncle or auntie. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with just telling them what their name is? Communicate to your children about your name and just not one name, mm -hmm. but your full names. And even if you can physically show your children where you work, the building, it is very important. Okay. Because they memorize, they, they have pictorial memories, they memorize these things. Mm -hmm. So communicate, where do you work? It is very important. Where do you live? Mm -hmm. It is very important. Which road? That information is very critical to a child. Christine, from part of that feedback, you could clearly see, and, and everyone was very careful to use the words, hell, it was the worst night for me. And, and, and what is not often spoken about is the agony, uh, you know, and the stress that, that, that parents go through uh, in such a situation. This brings about a lot of uh, psycho psychological trauma, uh, both to the parents and also to the children. Uh, based on what they have gone through, through uh, maybe trafficking, uh, if I may speak from a trafficking point of view, uh, these children are usually um, first, they are traumatized that they are not at home. Secondly, they are traumatized because they are subjected to a lot of torture and uh, physical abuse and emotional abuse. This traumatizes them a lot and so there's a uh, uh, 
very, very great need for psychosocial support uh, for both the parents and the children mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, help them in recovery uh, because this could eventually affect them. And we have seen cases where our children have gone through psychosocial support and it was escalated to psychiatric support. Mm -hmm. So they end up uh, having two kinds of support, that is psychosocial and psychiatric, mm -hmm. as a result of what they went through when they went missing or they were trafficked. Uh, uh, out of the whole experience, okay. it was a horrific one. And, and definitely that's an area that we often forget about because, uh, because sometimes due to the, you know, the inadequate resources that we have, we always focus on, let's just find the child. I mean, come on, mepata mtoto wako, mama, si, si, wende nyumbani, we have other cases to address. Mm. I, I totally agree with you. That is the attitude outside there. But honestly speaking, the most important uh, uh, phase for rehabilitation is psychosocial support. And this ensures the uh, mental well-being of the person and I cannot retaliate on the importance of um, a healthy state of mind mm -hmm. for both the children and, and the family because of uh, the whole experience. Okay. L let me just come back to you, Mariana, because in the past and in the village where I grew up in, I mean, the, it's, the life is very communal. We know that, you know, you belong to a certain family and I belong to this certain family. Uh, parents had double responsibility of even sort of disciplining or taking care of you. But nowadays we live in urban centers, one, where we are so many, you can't know everybody. And number two, there is the issue of how how do I know that this child is lost? And that sort of, in a way, sometimes complicates the response from uh, strangers and, and, and the community who sometimes, as you mentioned, might be very good, uh, might be more helpful than even the parent who doesn't know where the kid is. Um, it's about time we encouraged coming back together in the African way, the way we used to, for us to be able to protect our children better. Granted, uh, in urban areas, you left home probably at five to avoid the traffic commute. You come back at eight, you may not know your neighbors, but there are small opportunities here and there to interact and know. As a parent, it's very important to know who your child's friends are, both at school, at home, and in the larger environment. It also gives you um, some insights on your child's state of mind in mm -hmm. case they go missing, and even such people can give feedback. Uh, what we encourage is this kind of interaction because uh, when we now become very individualistic as a society, we sadly see people just passing by. A child is lost, they are crying, people say maybe the police will come and do it. Yeah. So if 10 people pass that child and it gets to evening, mm -hmm. something even worse than what could have uh, been in, uh, in the scope of things now could happen to this child. Mm -hmm. We want to encourage uh, now back to our African roots of kinship, community, uh, solidarity, looking out for one another so that we can be able to uh, uh, And now assist. that you've mentioned a child crying, th there are those tips that you can clearly see. This is because I was reading this story of someone who uh, the child got lost in a mall. And, and, and that was the end of the story because the child left the mall. So there's the issue of how do I know, what should I look out for to know that indeed this child uh, looks a bit uh, lost and might need help? Um, the mind of a child is very, very unique and puzzling. And uh, it might be hard to look out for some things because, again, the younger the child are, uh, the, the child is, uh, the more they are not quite aware of the situation, the gravity of the situation they are in. And so a lot of people have reported that they have found a three-year-old who's still playing and yet they are lost and separated from parents. Uh, maybe with the different age groups, you can be able to see some level of anxiety uh, because if a child is in a comfortable environment, let's say they're in a mall, they love going to the mall. They'll walk around the shops, look at everything. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets to the point that I am now hungry. Yeah, that's when you realize. That's when they realize, ours. yes, which could be ours. And so it is a neither here nor there. But we now also advise people who work in establishments that hold children to look at what are they establishing as child protection policies and measures. What are the employees of the mall, the shopping area, the children's playing area, what are they supposed to look out for? 
how long should an, an accompanied child walk around in a mall before everyone realizes. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we also instill these child protection measures in areas where uh, children um, uh, abound. Uh, it could be a school, it could be a church, it could be a, a play area, it could be a mall, a shopping center. So if we now start training the people who work in such areas on the importance of looking out for certain signs, they can be able to even look out for victims of trafficking. Um, in relation to Christine's case, you can find a teenage girl. She's with a slightly, uh, a slightly older, probably gentleman, who's probably fronting her as a child. But if you look at the body language, it's not very, very... Um, familial it's mm -hmm. really maybe the child looks under distress mm -hmm. so training is important for everybody who works in areas where children are so that we can be able to help them they can only help themselves up to a certain extent okay. yes and and maybe before we take this quick break vivian s sometimes when we talk about a missing child and i remember this is something that someone asked me just before uh we i came on the show sometimes we overlook that a child could mean anyone under 18 years and, and, and the, the, the issue of exploitation and being lured um, and the things that we need to spot, as Mariana says, should extend to even uh, ch children who are already in their teens. Yes. Um, the definition of a child, according to the Kenyan law, is that anyone who is below the age of 18 years is a child from 0 to 17 years. Mm -hmm. and predators take advantage of, of teens. This, this is true. Um, so as a community member, what you need to, we just want community members to be vigilant. We need to be very vigilant in identifying these children because I think the face, you can be able to tell a child from, from the face, not mainly the, the physical body, but the behavior and the face can tell you who, if this is, is a child. Because sometimes I think we take advantage of, of our physique mm -hmm. also, and mm -hmm. we, we tend to think that this person is over age. Identification is also important. Do they have, if for example, a child is traveling or someone is traveling that may be a child, do they have identification on them? Do they have IDs, for example? Because if you do not have ID, you may be a child. Okay. That, that's what I'm thinking. All right. All right. We have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because Vivian, Mariana, and Christine are staying with me. As we come back from this quick break, we will talk about the prevention strategies. How can we prevent more children, of course, from going missing, from being abducted, and from, uh, of course, pre protect them from being uh, victims of child trafficking. Don't go anywhere. to invest at a minimum of 20,000 for a term of 3, 6, 9 and 12 months at competitive interest rates. Open a fixed deposit account and start a journey of investments. Tower Saku, a basket for all your financial needs. Ni swala ambalo limetatiza mafisi wengi. Huenda ikawa anaepiga simu anataka kukula fea. Ama msupa amejipa kiro safi Nduru za kuamini kazi metufikia ya kwamba To get more hama fisi Dial star 811 star 935 hash Skiza na nation it's one platform where everybody has a voice. If we don't have jobs, it if we be, don't have money, it will be if, we're not, if our business... <laughs> Hosted by the King of Wit. Do you know the Bible to that much detail? It's basically everybody's show. Vitamin <laughs> Dania. <laughs> I have decided. <laughs> the Wicked Edition with Dr. King Ori 
and the Guesswork CEO, Kenya Jui. The Kisumu County Assembly specializes in stimulants to be specific concentrated coffee. Where humor meets sense. <laughs> the Wicked Edition. Every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Only on NTV. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optisorb formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. <laughs> You're watching your world on NTV this morning. Thank you for staying with us. We are talking about the burden of missing children in Kenya and in Africa and across the world, the agony and the frustration and the suffering that it leaves on their parents and the gaps in the system that should protect uh, these children. My guests this morning are still with me. Vivian Mangoli is the, chief, is the principal children officer at the Department for Children's Services. Uh, also with me in studio this morning is Christine Masharia. She's the shelter manager uh, at the Awareness Against Human Trafficking in Kenya, as well as Mariana Muniendo. She's the founder and CEO of Missing Child Kenya. Earlier on, we asked you to be p part of this conversation, of course, and we gave you uh, the lines on our, on our screens to call us and be part of the conversation. We also asked you, um, has your child ever gone missing? And, of course, how did you uh, get them back or how did you uh, be reunited with them? We'll be sampling part of the feedback that you sent, at, sent us in a short while. But let me just uh, come, start, come back uh, to you, Mariana, because in 2016, I believe that's when you started this organization uh, called Missing Child Kenya. Ideally, um, I believe you should be in, in, in the media industry, if I'm not wrong. Uh, how did you find yourself, of course, beginning this journey of Missing Child? Um, in my background, I worked in different sectors, but among them the education sector, yeah. where I had an opportunity to work with children. And um, I realized I was working with vulnerable children, and I realized that was part of where our gaps also were in terms of who are we listing as these vulnerable children, and is there a database that we can also try and reunify them with family. Because there's a big challenge of what we are now calling institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Children are being put in institutions where there could be an alternative where we can try to reunite them with even next of kin. Because an institution is not the best place for a child to grow up, but out of lack of another option, then it should be the last option. And so that is where now the issues of data came up. And uh, looking at that from 2016, uh, we have had uh, different milestones and challenges in terms of um, uh, data and reporting, but I would still go back to the point of our interactions with the families. Mm -hmm. We have cases from as far back as 2016 of people who had never documented their case and a child is missing as far back as 2010. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges of such families of children who have gone missing for quite a long time? Their biggest fear is somebody has forgotten. People will forget who their children are. And so they keep worrying about what would happen. They feel that um, they are not able to be in control of situations or even protect their current children. Family structures have broken down because of issues of missing children. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is to hold the memory of these children into the face of the public so that we keep reminding them that as much as it's seven years, four years, five years, this child still is missing and they need to come back home. And that is the point that Vivian was talking about at DCS. When they encounter a case and they make their referral mechanism, we are one of the organizations that they send families to so that we can be able to document these cases in an accurate manner. Mm -hmm. What a lot of parents don't know is maybe a child is seven years old and probably you hand a, a photo of them when they are four years old. 
so it's hard for people to really figure out who this child is. So we assist the family to put factual, timely information mm -hmm. that can uh, uh, pass the test of time and still stand there to remind the community that this child still needs to come back to family. Okay. Have you ever dealt with a case of a child who had gone missing, the family has kept looking and they're still yet to, to find them up to today? Um, a lot of cases. Uh, in our database, we have probably over a hundred and uh, 90 children that are still missing. Mm. And um, uh, I'll give um, an abstract of a case in relation to the ups and downs of a family. There's a father whose daughter went missing in uh, year 2016. And what happens is every time he sees we have posted an alert on our platforms at Missing Child Kenya mm -hmm. that another child has been found, he will come in and ask, what about mine? Have you mm -hmm. forgotten about mine? Mm -hmm. And his range of emotions vary. Sometimes he can call just to check up. And sometimes he can call because he's angry. Yeah. And sometimes he can call because he's afraid. Mm -hmm. And there's another time he called because he was so sad that... He had gotten a second child and the first child who's missing is not there to be able to see their sibling. Mm -hmm. And so the, the burden that is put on these families is very heavy. And even in related cases, you find the siblings of such children. Sometimes we ignore them. We focus on the such as others and we forget the small children, the brothers, sisters, who playmates who have lost their sibling. And they're undergoing also other issues connected to that. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we now start coming together as different organizations and form support mechanisms where I can be able to say, this is a case I have, who can do uh, counseling, either psychiatric or psychosocial, mm -hmm. who can do support uh, based on the available government systems, who can provide shelter. So it takes us all. There's no one single organization that will come up and uh, have a silver bullet to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. We need to come together, a lot of organizations, and uh, do something that will be able to create a very strong child protection system. Okay, and, and, and maybe Vivian, definitely this is a responsibility that sometimes cannot be really left alone uh, to the government alone and, 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 and raises the valid point uh, that Mariana is talking about partnerships. Just talk to us about um, how that structure looks like and the, the, the other organizations and partners that you work with in this, in this journey of helping people uh, reconnect with their children and prevent these cases of missing children. I concur with Marianne that uh, in addressing cases of missing children, no organization can work in isolation. Um, the Department of Children's Services will act as the coordinator of all the other partners that provide services for missing children. We have the police whose mandate is to investigate these cases. Uh, we have the Department of Children's Services who, apart from providing psychological support, they also place these children in, in rescue centers and institutions uh, within the country. We also have organizations like Heart Kenya and, and Missing Child, for example, who are, are very timely in posting the information about the children online and, and posters. There are different actors, education sector, where we work with the schools to just educate children on, on, on skills to protect themselves and also to help them identify who is um, a trusted adult and who is not a trusted adult. So various actors come together and it also brings out the issue of data because this data is captured also by different actors and that is why we have the Child Protection Information Management System that we are encouraging all actors to feed into mm -hmm. because we also do not want to replicate numbers. You know, the same child has been reported at the sub-county children office, the same child has been reported at the police, mm -hmm. the same child has been reported at, at Missing Child Kenya, and we are counting these children as different children, yet it is only one child. So the issue of coordination, we, we may say that we have made tremendous steps towards achieving uh, at this and having just a centralized system where all this data is, is captured. And you see that will go further to just ensure the particulars of the child are also captured and it's just not a matter of, of numbers so that okay. we can know. So this system, this centralized system, do we have it already in place and we just need to improve it or is it something that we need to develop? It is already in place mm -hmm. and we are working on improving 
in terms of even getting the photos of the children, such that if I'm a member of the public and I want to access information, I can always just go online and, and get this information. Okay, let me just go, uh, go back to Christine. Where do you fit in, in this jigsaw? And have you found yourself in a situation before where maybe um, you have uh, successfully maybe recovered uh, maybe children who are being trafficked, but now reconnecting them with their families becomes a problem? Yes, um, what happens is uh, we used to run a shelter uh, for girl victims of trafficking. So we would closely work with the government and particularly the sub-county children's officer who would do the rescue and then refer the children to us for rehabilitative uh, services. And when I say rehabilitative services, I mean um, uh, things like psychosocial support, shelter, uh, legal aid where necessary in case there's, uh, we aid in um, prosecution because we can't do prosecution directly. And then um, there's also family tracing and then uh, there's also reintegration and repatriation. So uh, on the same, family tracing and reintegration is very crucial and very important. And how we do it is through our social workers who closely work with our children officers based on the information that they are given by the children after uh, actually um, screening interview. They, they trace where these children came from. And sometimes we have cases of um, children who we are trying to um, trace their families back in Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania. And uh, we work closely also with their governments and other uh, key stakeholders like CSOs in those uh, countries. And yes, we have had successful cases where we have traced and actually reunited the children with their families. But of course, this comes with a lot of effort and also um, a lot of uh, rehab, uh, psychosocial support to the child and the family too. You just don't reintegrate them. There's that step, uh, step by step, and especially if they have been away from home for a very long time, there's that need for you to do psychosocial support to the family and also to the child. And also we have had instances where children had to be taken to other shelters before they were actually reintegrated back home because they were missing for a very long time. I think it was around six years. So you can just take that child back to the family. Mm -hmm. It had to be very gradual, like in terms of uh, they, need to, they need to know like uh, their new family members, like in terms of their sisters and brothers and what have you. But eventually it ended up being um, uh, very successful and also look at other areas of uh, like economic empowerment when you look at uh, the push and pull factors of trafficking look at that family as a whole and identify what was the push and pull factor of trafficking and if it was poverty how do you address it mm -hmm. in linking them to social protection services or um, giving them business startup kits uh, for them to be able to provide for their families and where children don't have to feel like they need to help their parents to find, uh, I mean, to fend for their family. Okay. And, and definitely we have special groups uh, of children that are a bit more vulnerable than the others. If you look at maybe issues to do with refugees and maybe uh, people who are uh, able differently or uh, people who have disabilities because uh, you mentioned earlier that one of those uh, classifications for tra for trafficking are people who are trafficked for forced begging and we see them every day in the streets. Hmm. Yes, it is uh, true indeed and um, it becomes a challenge especially when you have a case of a child who has been trafficked for purposes of begging and at the same time they have um, uh, if an intellectual disorder if I may put it that way, it mm -hmm. becomes very hard to trace their families. But um, for this case, we work closely with the government uh, and also the registration uh, point, like mm -hmm. um, birth certificates and what have you, mm -hmm. like with the Tanzanian government. Uh, we did that and we were able to trace uh, families for three children who were actually uh, victims of forced begging. Okay. And we watch, we traced them back, uh, and we reintegrated them. Okay. 
And, and of course, I think we're running out of time. You want to sample part of the feedback that you've been sending us in a short while uh, before we begin to close this conversation. But we have to talk about uh, prevention measures. Yes, uh, remember, Ari alone, we asked you, has your child ever gone missing? How did you uh, get them back? That's on our question of the day. Uh, part of the feedback coming in is Meg Marjorie says, my child got lost for three days at the age of eight years in Dandora. I was going mad. God redirected him to his uncle's place. He called, uh, he called me to pick him up. I thank God. Thank you. Uh, Noel and Dinda says, my one-year-old son once got lost at Mombasa and a good Samaritan took him to the mosque. Then he was announced during the 6 p.m. Mwadini. Otherwise, singe kuwa na mtoto sahi. God is always good. Thank you, Noel and Dinda, for sharing your story. Beth Njoki says, only for two, for two hours, but it looked like a year to me. May God protect all children. Thank you, Beth Njoki, for sharing uh, your story. Rosalia Modoga says, Mimi nilikuwa admitted hosi sa, sa siku ya kutolewa nikafika kwa hao kitu ya kwanza niliuliza wapi mtoto babake kwanza kumtafuta hakumpata but alipatikana after three days we mungu tu asante sana rosalia modoga and definitely as we start to close this conversation uh, it takes us back to, the, to that kind of feedback we are receiving it takes us back to the pain that we we mentioned earlier on the, the agony that that parents have to go through she said it's two hours, but it feels like a year. Um, it, it makes you panic. The minute you realize that a child who is a part of you, mm -hmm. uh, an extension of your existence is missing, everything stops. And probably what happens at this point also is um, you become confused. There's a lot of running emotions in your head. And sometimes you might do things that are not um, helpful towards the search process. Mm -hmm. When we work with the families that have called and uh, reported a missing child on our different platforms, we normally seek out to see again who is a close support person to this mother or the father. It doesn't matter. People assume that fathers cannot be hysterical over their children. Mm -hmm. You can be in a state of panic that you cannot even give uh, factual information. Mm -hmm. So what we try to collect is the important information about the picture. An image is very important. Mm -hmm. We said time is very important. Yeah. Immediately go to a police station once you have cleared your surrounding search. Make the report, get an OB number get a photo of the child because people will be able to look at the image and help in the search yeah. factual information where do they go to school because those would be points of contact that will assist in the search process okay yes and and in terms of of the child what are those things that the child needs to know uh what are those things that we need to teach them so that it can hide in any time they're lost uh, number one, uh, bio data about the child is important, but it's also age appropriate. In some instances, a two-year-old will not be able to assist. Or for instance, a child with uh, special needs, like an autistic nonverbal child, will not be able to talk much about themselves. But bio data of a child constitutes of my full names, mm -hmm. uh, so that we avoid children uh, maybe using nicknames that will not help in them being reunited with their family. Even if there's a nickname, we're not discouraging them. They come from an intimate nature. But a child knowing their full names, where they go to school, where they go to church, where they live, where their parents work. We've had a child who kept mentioning, they were brought to Milimani Children's Court and they kept mentioning Weetabix. And it was quickly found that their father works at Weetabix. Oh. And by midday they were reunited with family. Mm -hmm. So such so bio data, the smallest. simplest, smallest things can mm -hmm. be of greatest help. Okay. Yes. Ladies, I have to get your closing remarks because we're running out of time. Let me just start with you, Vivian, from where you see uh, at the directorate and the Department of Children's Services. Uh, talk to us about um, what we need to do for perhaps to protect more children against the risks that come with uh, going missing and even the extremes uh, of child trafficking. As community members, we need to stop being bystanders. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to stop witnessing violence and, and just ignoring it. We need to be more vigilant. We need to spot it and stop it. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, recognize and, and know that children services are all over the country. We, we have uh, children offices in all sub-counties. We have authorized officers everywhere. This is the police, the AP. Use Nyumbakumi structures 
there are there community policing structures they are there we need to use these structures to protect our children and these structures are consisted of you and me as mm -hmm. members of the community so the responsibility starts with you as a member of the community okay Thank and, you. and maybe for Christine, every time the child gets lost, we, we don't want to think about the extremes, that it could, could be even a case of, of child trafficking and all the bad things that happen after that once a child is trafficked. Just talk to us uh, from where you sit uh, in your closing remarks. It is uh, the reality that, yes, it could go to those extremes. So what I would recommend is that we partner from the community level in terms of uh, us taking care of our children and also create more awareness on in terms of what um, is out there uh, in terms of trafficking and children going missing let's create awareness let us partner let us work against this vice and also address the push and pull factors through our social structures and also our government institutions uh, we support each other in this journey and through it all we'll conquer okay and, and, and maybe before, before uh, I get your closing remarks, there was another question that someone uh, asked that we ask. In a situation where the child has not been found completely, and even the body uh, of the child has also not been found, which means there's no closure, which just happens uh, in that space. Um, there is uh, the legal provisions, even for adults, of how long um, a missing person should stay before um, they are declared uh, probably deceased. I may not have them top of my mind, but there's such laws that apply to that. But again, that law also applies to the family's willingness now to come up front and say, we are now declaring our person deceased. And so it is a delicate balance of keeping hope alive mm -hmm. and also working with the practicality of declaring someone deceased. Mm -hmm. For adults, it ends up declaring someone deceased because people are interested in our property, heritage, and inheritance. Mostly for children's cases, a lot of people keep hope alive mm -hmm. because they are saying, even if it takes 50 years, yeah. I would like to mm -hmm. be reunited with my child. of course, we saw the story of the man who returned after 57 years. So mm -hmm. you would want to keep the, the, the hope alive. Uh, from where you sit, how can we... Uh, make this situation better? How can we reduce those numbers of children who go, um, who go missing every year? How can we even protect them once they go missing? Uh, we start with prevention. Uh, education awareness is very important at uh, institutional level, at um, religious level. We have so many structures that can help us uh, implement training programs or communication uh, mechanisms that will help us empower the community and also empower our children, so to speak. Because we can never be around our children 100%, but if we empower them, they can be able to protect themselves. For casework, I would encourage uh, people to reach out to our organization. Mm -hmm. We work with the the partners that have been listed including the government we have different platforms we are very robust on social media look for missing child kenya and we also have a toll free line 0800 double two mm -hmm. double three double four someone can be able to quickly call up and we can be able to collect information and send you to all these other partners that you need support from. Mm -hmm. For aftercare, aftercare is also very important. We should not forget what happens when these children return home or like I spoke about their siblings and everyone else. Mm. So again, we seek to see how we can be able to also create strong aftercare programs that will be able to keep the mental uh, well-being of this family mm -hmm. still up there so that they remain a strong unit. Yeah, because sometimes in, in situations the child can return and the parent feels like hey, this, this is not my, the this child is that not I the know. Child that I and, know. And, the, and the kid feels a bit different. This is not, you know, uh, how you, things used to be. Mm -hmm. So we would like to bridge that disconnect because I, like I, I, I started by saying the safest place for a child most of the time is home so let us create safer homes for our children okay yes wonderful of course the discussion of the day we have been talking about the burden of missing children in kenya uh, there are no accurate figures as to how, ma how many children go missing every year in kenya but the reasons range from a uh, lack of course of supervision to the extremes of where people actually abduct children uh, for child trafficking. Many thanks to my guests and my panelists this morning for this conversation. Uh, Christine Masharia, she's a shelter manager 
at uh, the awareness against human trafficking in Kenya. Uh, many thanks, of course, also to uh, Vivian Mangoli. She's a principal children officer at the Department of Children's Services in Kenya, as well as Mariana Muniendo. She's the founder and CEO of Missing uh, Children Kenya. And that's where we wrap it up. We go for a quick break. But once we come back, we talk about money and wealth creation. See you then.